welcome back. Tonight we're going to be talking about constellations. And so I've got the constellation part kind of divided into three different sections. One of them deal with the circumpolar of constellations, which everybody needs to watch. And then I've got both the summer constellations and the winter constellations. So whichever one you don't need to watch, you could just go ahead and skip that. But I do want you to be paying attention to what's going on outside in the sky. And you need to go to skymaps.com and they will give you a download every month for what's going on. And so you'll see the map and then you'll see, you know, the kinds of objects that you can see just with the naked eye, what a small pair of binoculars would let you see, as well as anything that's going on special during that month. So again, I encourage you to make sure you're heading to skymaps.com every month to see what's going on. So now you can see that I have the entire universe in front of me. Okay, so there's my universe, or at least the part that we're going to talk about today. And so you can see that the Earth is in the center. And remember when we talked about the celestial sphere. So this is our celestial sphere right here. And here are our equators. Excuse me, those are not our equators. Those are our axes and our poles. And so this is the north celestial pole. That's a south celestial pole. And then, of course, we've got our equator right through here. Well, we're going to use that to determine where our constellations are that are the more common ones that I think you probably need to know. And so imagine that you're sitting on the Earth and it's night and you're looking out. And so we're going to look at these constellations that you're going to see over a period of about a year. So I'm going to go ahead and look at each one of them. And like I said, guys, I've got them broken apart into summer and winter and then the circumpolar. Circumpolar is basically what you're going to see right up through here that are visible all year. And if you lived in the southern hemisphere, you would see the southern or the south uh, uh, celestial, excuse me, the south circumpolar constellations down here. But that always then will give you a feel for which direction is north. And you can always locate yourself on where the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper is, things like that. And then we're going to talk about how you're going to sky jump or star jump from each constellation to be able to find your way around. So guys, with that, let's go ahead and start talking about constellations and the constellations that I want you to know. Now, if you look and you see this picture right here, you notice it just looks like a bunch of dots. Now, unfortunately, there are no lines in the sky that really talk about where those constellations are. And so the first time you go out and look, it's probably going to be kind of hard to try and put some focus on those constellations that we're looking at. And remember that the constellations are simply nothing more than a region within the sky itself. We are going to use, most of the time, the ancient Greek and Roman names for the constellations. And for their definition, the constellations were just the star patterns themselves. And so those are what I want you to go ahead and know. Okay, guys, so let's go ahead and start talking about our constellations. Now, the website that you see right there is the one that I referred to before. It always gives you the map for the particular month that we're in. I realize that this will be used in a variety of semesters, so we're going to do the North Circumstance polar constellations, and then I'm going to do summer constellations and winter constellations. So just kind of pick whichever one of the two that you need, because you'll always need the circumpolar constellations. And then, like I said, either depending on the winter or the summer time when you're taking this course. Now, if you look at this picture right here, notice you see just lots and lots of dots. Well, it's really kind of hard to go ahead and start putting constellations to them unless we have some place to start. And so the way that we're going to start is by looking at where the celestial equator is, where the celestial then, where the ecliptic is, and then kind of go from there with where we're putting our constellations and being able to identify where they are. Now this is a map of, remember I talked about the middle part of that celestial sphere? So I've taken off the top and I've taken off the bottom and this then is half of that celestial sphere made out of a map that I can just lay out flat. This actually happens to be the winter constellation part, whereas this one then is the summer constellations. Now the purple line that I have drawn right here is a celestial equator. So remember, take that celestial our equator, extend it out to the celestial sphere, and that becomes a celestial equator. So here it is on the winter constellations, there it is on the summer constellations. Then between, you have your, as you're transitioning from winter to spring or from spring, or excuse me, from winter to summer or summer to winter, you know you've got the spring and you've got the fall constellations in there. 
I'm not really going to talk about those, but you can see on both of these maps, you're going to see those transitions as you go from those winter to uh, summer constellations. Now, the other important thing that we need to look at in the sky is where is the ecliptic? And we've talked about the constellations of the zodiac that lie along the ecliptic. Remember, the ecliptic is the apparent path that the sun takes among the stars. So here it is during the winter months. And notice, guys, in this case, it goes above the celestial equator, where if I get over here in our summer constellations, it then is below the celestial equator. The points where it reaches the maximum above and maximum below, as well as the point that it crosses the celestial equator then, are our days of the first day of spring, the first day of summer, the first day of winter, and the first day of fall. When we talk about seasons, then we'll look at those individual points. So let's talk about the circumpolar constellations. They are Ursula Major, Ursa Minor, and the big... Dipper and the Little Dipper are probably the ones that you're more familiar with instead of the Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Then we have Cassiopeia, Cephas, and Draco. And out of those five circumpolar constellations, there's really only one star I want you to be familiar with, and that's Polaris. That's in the Little Dipper. And Polaris is our pole star. So take the, uh, the Earth's axis, the north axis, extend it up to the celestial sphere and where the Earth's axis runs into the celestial sphere at the North Pole, then, is the star Polaris. And so that's what the entire sky appears to turn around. Now, this is that same kind of map that I showed you earlier that's laid flat out, only now we are looking specifically at the upper part or the North Circumpolar Constellations. Circumpolar Constellations, guys, means that these constellations will be visible 365 days out of the year. And again, that's assuming that you can actually go outside and look up and you don't see clouds. But they're out there. They're just going to all appear to turn around Polaris. And we're going to find Polaris is right there in the center of this map. And I will be sending you links on Blackboard on how to download these maps that I've been using. So let's talk about those five circumpolar constellations. You see they're all in red now. The one at the bottom you can see is Ursa Major or the Big Dipper. Now, there are more stars within this constellation than what I'm talking about because we're just going to concentrate on that more common component of the Big Dipper. Then you see that I have a bright yellow arrow, and that's pointing toward the star Polaris. And Polaris is in the Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor. So you see the Big Dipper there, you see the Little Dipper. Then between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, you're going to see a constellation that kind of just slithers between those two. Well, that's Draco the dragon. Okay. And then I have Cephas and I have Cassiopeia. So I have circled the Big Dipper. There's two stars that are in the Dipper part that do act as the pointer stars. And so notice if I take those two stars and I've circled them in green, they're going to point toward Polaris. So you can always find where Polaris is based on being able to find the Big Dipper. So that's the first constellation, guys, that you want to learn how to find. What is the Big Dipper and where is it in the sky? Now, hint, guys, it's always going to be in the north. Make sure you stand looking toward the north. Find it. It will point you directly toward the Polaris, which is going to be, again, that star that the entire sky appears to turn around. And so that's why I have that yellow arrow, because so I take those two green stars, run a line through there, and that points to Polaris. And I've got Polaris circled in green, and then I have two other stars that are in the dipper of the Little Dipper, dipper part of the Little Dipper. Well, those two stars are the ones that you most commonly see. The stars between those stars that I have in green for the Little Dipper are really very, very hard to see. Generally, you see Polaris pretty well, and you see those other two stars in the dipper part of the Little Dipper. And unless you've got incredibly bright skies, you're going to lose the middle of the Little Dipper. Okay? So I've got Big Dipper. I've got the pointer stars. I get to Polaris. Now I'm going to find the head of Draco the dragon. So you can kind of see that red constellation that goes between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. 
and kind of slithers around there. And those four stars then that I've got circled in purple are the head of the dragon. And that's pretty easy to go ahead and find. And so once you find that, then you can kind of backtrack toward the body of the serpent or the dragon. And then now if I hit Draco the dragon and I head up to the top, Following that little blue arrow, I'm going to head up a little bit north, toward the north. Then I'm going to get Cephas. Now Cephas, at least for what we see right here, looks like a house. I'm going to find out that Cephas is a king, and he happens to be married to Cassiopeia. And the next section that we talk about on Blackboard, guys, I, we will go over the mythology of the constellations and kind of give you a feel of what those things look like in the sky with pictures and then the descriptions of what did the ancient people think of those constellations and why did they put those particular constellations in the sky? What was important about Cephas? What was important about Draco the dragon? Okay. What did Cephas have to do with Cassiopeia and what did Cassiopeia have to do with Andromeda? So I think it's always interesting to look at some of that mythology and to look at the groups that were put in there when we put the ancient people went ahead and named their constellations. Now, we're using the ancient Greek and Roman names for the most part, but realize every culture, every ancient culture that we have out there had their own set of names for these various stars. They weren't necessarily in the same patterns, but at least they were the same stars that then the different cultures made various patterns out of. So it's always interesting, and we'll include just a little bit of some of the other cultures when we talk about the mythology as well. Okay, so I'm back to Cephas. You've got those four stars that form the house, and then you've got the roof line that extends above that. And notice that that roof line goes kind of toward Polaris. So that's another way of finding Polaris if you want to come in on the opposite direction. And then if I head again up, then I'm going to get to Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia, we're going to find, is basically the queen's throne. And depending on what season you're looking at, Cassiopeia can look like either a big M or a big W. Now remember, guys, these circumpolar constellations are visible 365 days out of the year. However, they're always going to rotate around Polaris. So sometimes you'll see the Big Dipper down toward the bottom of the sky. Sometimes you'll see it toward the top of the sky. It just kind of depends on your particular season. And that skymaps.com will always go ahead and show you where those circumpolar constellations are, as well as all the other constellations in relative to those circumpolar constellations. So what we're going to find the easiest way to steer your way through the sky is either to constellation jump or to star jump. Some constellations don't have really bright stars, so that's we'll have to rely on the asterism, the actual star patterns themselves, as opposed to the bright stars. Now then... I have two stars that I have circled in blue here. Again, one of them is Polaris, and I certainly do want you to know the name of Polaris. But the other two are part of a multiple star system out of the Big Dipper, and they're called Mizar and Alcor. And when you look at those two stars through a telescope, it does look pretty obvious that those two stars are really close together, which leads you to believe that they indeed are going around each other. Now, that's not necessarily true. You could have two stars that just happen to be really close to each other and we're just looking at them. But one of the activities that I will have us do when we get into stars, which would be our third unit, is something called proper motion. And that's the actual motion that the stars have. And so we will plot the Big Dipper and we'll also plot a constellation called Leo and see what the motion of the individual stars are doing. Are they just looking... Right now, if we're talking about the Big Dipper, they're forming a Big Dipper now. What are they going to look like in 26,000 years? Will we still see the Big Dipper? And we'll come back and we'll look at Mizar and Alcor and try and decide, are Mizar and Alcor moving in the same direction? Or are they moving totally random of each other? They're moving in the same direction, and that does give us um, a good indication that they are indeed a multiple star system. They are going around each other, or at least around their common center of mass they're totally random, then it just means they happen to be right in the same orientation when we look at it. And so that's one of the reasons why we do that proper motion lab. Also, it kind of shows you the motion of the stars because unfortunately, over our lifetime, 
unless those stars are really, really, really close, we're really never going to see any motion of the stars themselves. Okay, so now let's talk about winter constellations. So we had this North Circumpolar constellations. See those things all year round, they're just going to rotate around Polaris. In terms of winter constellations, there are several constellations I'd like you to be aware of. One of them is the constellation Leo with the bright star Regulus. Then Cancer, Gemini with the two bright stars Castor and Pollux. Taurus with the bright star Deberon. Perseus, Aries, Orion. And we've got two bright stars in Orion, basically Betelgeuse, which is the way most people call it, the common tongue, and Rigel. Then we have... You know, if you're a hunter like Orion, you certainly need your two faithful dogs. So that's Canis Major and Canis Minor. Canis Major has a bright star Cirrus, and that's one of the brightest stars in the sky. Canis Minor has the star Procyon. And then we have Cetus and we have Pisces. Now, if you look at those constellations that I just gave you, you will notice some of them are indeed the constellations of the zodiac. So remember guys, those are going to lie right along the ecliptic. So here's that same map that I showed you earlier. I took all the marks off of it. And so this is where we're going to find those winter constellations. Okay, now I've put back the celestial equator and the ecliptic. So now let's start looking at the individual constellations and find out where they are. Okay, there's all of them just marked in red. And we're going to go through and we're going to talk about them each individually. But you can see where that ecliptic was. There's your ecliptic, that yellow line, that a lot of those constellations then lie along the ecliptic. Remember, the ecliptic is the apparent path that the sun takes through the background of stars. Now, it also means that when you get your sun sign, is that's where the sun was during the time that you were born. So let's go ahead and start looking at each one of these individual constellations. And the first one we're going to look at is Orion. And so I've circled it here. And you can see that Orion is a hunter. And I've circled the two bright stars. Betelgeuse is the one toward the upper left, and Rigel is the one toward the lower right. We're going to find that Rigel is an extremely big, hot blue star, whereas Betelgeuse is a really big, hot red star. So when we get into characteristics of stars, we'll look at why Betelgeuse might be red and what does that tell us about the evolutionary sequence of that star and what's going on with Rigel when Rigel is still very, very hot and very blue. Okay? And you can kind of see that Orion does indeed look like a hunter. He's kind of there. He's got his arm raised over for a sword. Then we've got his belt. And then there's also going to be Orion's sword. And we're going to find out that that's actually got an interesting little nebula material in there, which we're going to call the Orion Nebula, which we'll come back and look at here real shortly. Okay, right now we're just going to concentrate on constellations and on stars. Okay, so that's Orion. And remember that Orion has two faithful dogs. That's Canis Major and Canis Minor. Canis Minor is the one that's a little bit above a little bit to the north, whereas Canis Major is the one that's down a little bit to the south. And you can see that right, kind of right now it's in red, star that is pro, or excuse me, that is Cirrus. And like I said, guys, that's going to be one of the brighter stars in the sky. I want you to get used to going outside when it's kind of twilight, hasn't completely gotten dark yet. And as it gets dark then and your eyes become dark adapted, then those brighter stars are going to start jumping out. And Cirrus is certainly one of them that's going to jump out really quickly. The only thing that might interfere a little bit with being able to see Cirrus as the brightest star is if we have one of our planets out. If Jupiter or if Saturn or Mars is out, that might cause a little bit of confusion. But once you get used to where you're going to find these objects, then you just kind of look in that area, it's going to pop out, and you won't have any problems at all. Now, if I go to Canis Minor, notice that I just have about three stars in there. It's a small constellation, and that brighter star in there is indeed Procyon. So we've got Canis Major, Canis Minor, big dog, little dog, we've got the hunter. 
Now let's head over to Leo the Lion. And it is one of the constellations of the zodiac, and it is incredibly easy to recognize. When you see Orion, or excuse me, see Leo right there, you get the sickle part of Leo, which is the head of the lion, and then you can kind of see that body as it comes back out. So the sickle part, which is kind of looks like a big question mark in the sky, and then the body is behind it. So that's Leo the lion. Then we have the next constellation of the zodiac, and that's the constellation Cancer. And it kind of looks like an upside down Y in the sky. Okay. And then if I come on over, I get Gemini. Gemini, remember, has the two stars called Castor and Pollux. Castor is the one that's a little bit to the right and up a little bit. And those are about equal brightness. Hence the name Gemini, the twins. And then you see that kind of rectangle that comes down. And Gemini is also a real easy constellation to go ahead and recognize. Then I come on over to Taurus the bull. And what you see there are the horns of Taurus the bull. And they come on down to Aries. Aries, unfortunately, isn't a real big constellation, and sometimes it's a little hard to see. There aren't any really bright stars in there, but it's between Taurus the Bull and between Pisces. And one of the ways that we can recognize Aries, it also happens to be above the constellation Cetus, which we'll talk about here in just a second, but it's that constellation in red that's right below Aries. Okay, so Aries is a constellation of the zodiac. I go ahead and hit Pisces. Pisces is an extremely large constellation. In fact, it goes from the winter part of the sky over to the summer part of the sky. So it's certainly one of those that is very noticeable then as we're transitioning from the winter skies to the summer skies. And you only actually see half of it right here. When we get into the summer part, we'll see the rest of it. Then we have Cetus. This is a whale or a sea monster. And it's pretty easy to recognize because of the two kind of squash squares in there. And if you can see that upper square that's right below Aries, if you find that, then you can find Aries pretty easily. And then I have a Riga. A Riga looks an awful lot like a lopsided house. Now, remember I said Cephas also looks like a lopsided or a house. And, but you're going to find that in the northern part because of those northern constellations, with those northern circumpolar regions. And so, yeah, we kind of have two houses, but one of them is definitely going to be different than the other because of the position that it's going to take in the sky. Okay? So you got a Riga, and then the last one was Perseus. I don't know about you guys, but I think Perseus looks like a big pie sign in the sky. Think about that 3.14. You know, think about your math and the big pi sign. That's kind of what I think Perseus looks like. So that kind of gave us then the constellations during the winter months. Okay, so we've got Leo, got Cancer, got Gemini, we got Taurus, we've got Aries, there's Pisces, we're going to hit Orion with its two bright stars. We've got Canis Major and Canis Minor. We've got Cephas the dragon, or the sea monster, or the whale, kind of depending on which way you'd like to look at it. Then we've got Auriga, and we've got Perseus. Now, those are the bright stars. Notice now what you have is the red constellations with things circled in blue. Okay, well, those are the bright stars, and I gave you on that list earlier, but you can see that I have two of them in Orion. Again, that's going to be Betelgeuse and Rigel. You can see there's Cirrus down with Canis Major. There's Procyon with Canis Minor. Then you have Leo the Lion. You've got Arcturus there. Then notice we get to Gemini. And there's Castor and Pollux. Then we get to Taurus the Bull. 
And Tarsipul has got the bright star Aldebaran, and it's extremely red, so it's real easy to find. Now, let's look at Taurus for just a second. There is another constellation, this little bitty, that I didn't go ahead and refer to yet, and I want to talk just briefly about the Pleiades. Well, the Pleiades are really an open star cluster, and so we're going to look at those as looking at something telling us about the evolution of stars. And you can kind of see that that's really a little open star cluster when you look at it in the sky. You can see about six of them, although sometimes they're also called the Seven Sisters. But like I said, they're also really easy to find. And then we get Auriga, which gives us the bright star Capella. Okay, now notice that I've got several things marked in green. Now those are Messier objects. Messier was, Charles Messier made a chart because he kept getting confused between deep sky objects and he was looking for comets. So he wanted to come up with a list of things that he knew was not a comet so that when he was out there trying to discover a comet, he could already mark those things off because he knew that those smudges that he saw in space were not then something that was going to become a new comet. So that's why we have this Messier catalog, and you have on Blackboard, you have references to Messier, and I've got a URL for you to go ahead and copy the Messier charts off. Messier objects are sometimes also called deep sky objects. And so you see that I have four of them. One of them was the open star cluster looking at the Pleiades, and that's the one that's coming off of Taurus the Bull. If you go back and look at Orion, then I have circled the Orion Nebula, which is a middle, quote, star in Orion's sword. Then I have a cluster in Cancer, which is called the Beehive. And then up toward Perseus, I have H and Chi, which are a double star system, excuse me, which is a double cluster. So let's look at the beehive cluster. And this is a picture of the beehive in Cancer. It's an open cluster of stars, which means that those stars all form from the same material about the same time. When we get into stellar evolution, that's going to be real handy because we can say, okay, what is the difference in these stars when I look at them and I see what they've done in terms of their evolutionary sequence? Because they all formed around the same time. They're all made up of essentially the same material. We find that the only difference is going to be the amount of mass that that star has when it starts. And so that's why these open clusters, number one, are just really cool to look at, but also give us a great deal of information. Now, this is the center of the Orion Nebula. It's a big gas and dust cloud out there in space. And when you look at Orion and you look at that middle star, it's just a tad bit fuzzy. You know? And so it really takes a good pair of binoculars or a telescope then to go ahead and see that this is a dust cloud, gas and dust in space. And the very center area is what is called the trapezium. And we have seen stars that have been born in that area. So now what does it mean for a star to be born? Well, basically, when my, that star starts converting hydrogen into helium, then we now have a star and does that through thermonuclear reactions. I just think when you look at it, this is a really cool picture of the Orion Nebula. Now these are the Pleiades. Remember I said that was an open star cluster? You can see that it's certainly more open than the one I showed you earlier in terms of that beehive. And when you look at it in the sky, you try and count those stars, you get about six. But when I look at them, there's certainly more than six or seven there. You know, this is a small open cluster with the only place between about 100, or excuse me, about 50 to 100 stars in there. That blue nebulous material that you see is basically material left over from when those stars formed. And then this is a double cluster up by Perseus. This is H and Chi. You can see that we are a little bit further away because you're seeing those open clusters as being a little bit more concentrated, but it just has to do with the distance that they're at. And so now we have two star clusters that form, again, at the same time, out of the same material, not only just in individual stars, but then they form side by side. And so they also look pretty cool through a telescope. So now let's go ahead and talk about the summer constellations. Well, here are our summer constellations. Andromeda, Pegasus, Aquarius, Capricornus, Delphonus, probably haven't heard of that one, but I really like that little constellation. So that's why it's on this list. 
We've got Cygnus with a bright star Deneb, Lyra with a bright star Vega, Aquila with a bright star Altair, and we have Hercules, Corona Borealis, Bootes, which has a bright star Arcturus, Sagittarius, Scorpio with a bright star Antares, Libra, and Virgo. So here's that same map again, only this time I'm on the other side, which means I'm looking at the summer constellations. Okay, so there are all those constellations. Now you see one little constellation that I've circled in yellow. Well, that's the extension of Pisces. Remember, we saw Pisces as a winter constellation, but I said it also extended over into the summer constellations. And that little circlet, which is that's what's that little section that I've got circled in yellow is called, is pretty easy to find. And so that gives you a feel for being able to find Pisces based on where that circlet is. And then you just kind of go over to go ahead then and look at the rest of the constellation. So let's look at Aquarius. That's again one of the constellations of the zodiac. You can see that they're all going to lie right along that ecliptic. So that's what Aquarius looks like. This is what Capricorn looks like. And it's pretty easy to see as well. It's kind of this little bit lopsided triangle there. Now I come on over from Capricorn and I get into the constellation Sagittarius. Most people just find Sagittarius by finding the little teapot. And that's what's called right there is a little teapot. Now one of the interesting things about Sagittarius, and when you guys get your map and you look at it, there's all kinds of deep sky objects around Sagittarius. Well, that's because when we look at Sagittarius, we are literally looking toward the center of our galaxy. So you go outside, you look up, look toward Sagittarius, and you're looking toward the center of the Milky Way. Then I come on around the ecliptic. I get into Scorpius. From Scorpius, then, I get into Libra. From Libra, I get into Virgo. And again, a lot of times when you're finding those constellations that don't have too many bright stars or just big areas, just kind of star jump. I mean, look where Bootes is. It's kind of right above Virgo. So I come down from there, and I then go ahead and find the constellation Virgo. Okay, then the next constellation I'm going to look at is Pegasus. And Pegasus, what you recognize is the bright, uh, the big square of Pegasus. So the big, nice square of Pegasus. Now, unfortunately, guys, you're only seeing about half of it here because the other half is sitting over on the winter side of the chart. But it makes a really nice big square. Remember, Pegasus is a flying horse. Then I'm coming over to Cygnus the Swan. Now, it doesn't show up on this map, but a lot of your maps will show the fact that Cygnus is sitting in the Milky Way, which means we're sitting in this one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. And so it kind of comes down uh, at kind of an angle and head then toward um, Sagittarius and Scorpius. When you go outside, you let your eyes become dark adapted, then the Milky Way will gradually go ahead and show up really nicely. Okay, then from Cygnus to Swan, I'm going to go to, remember I said my little favorite constellation, Delphinus. Basically looks like a little dolphin jumping out of the water. From that, I'm going to go to Lyra. Lyra is a really small constellation as well, and it kind of looks like a little parallelogram with one end having a big bright star off of it. Then I'm going to come down to Aquila. From Aquila, I'm going to go up to Hercules. Hercules is a hunter as well. You know, think about your mythology and think about what Hercules did. Really big, strong guy. 
Okay, and Hercules is extremely easy to see in the sky. You see the torso of Hercules, and then you kind of see his arms and his legs coming off of there. And more importantly, right beside Hercules is a little constellation called Corona Borealis, which is a really nice little semicircle of stars. And those little semicircle of stars then are really easy to find. And once you know where that is, you can also find Hercules by working backwards. So either find Hercules and then find Corona Borealis, find Corona Borealis and then go back to Hercules. They're easy to find. And same way with the next constellation, which is Bootes. Bootes looks like a big kite in the sky. And then you have the bright star down there. And you have then the two strings that are hanging down off of that kite. Really easy to go ahead and find. And then remember I said that, going back to Pegasus, okay, what you're seeing right here are the winter constellations. And Pegasus then just kind of finishes right there with that big square. But then notice coming off of the top of the square that heads in back to the left is a constellation Andromeda. And so Andromeda is actually Cassiopeia's daughter, and she's on the flying horse, and basically what you see is her hair flying out behind her. And so Andromeda is also pretty easy to go ahead and find. So there's the other side of Pegasus as well. Now, I've got a couple of blue marks on here, which, like they were before, are my stars, my really bright stars. Okay, so if I look at my bright stars right here, if I look at Scorpius, which is down at the bottom, that's Antares. If I look at Bootes, I have that bright star Arcturus. And then I have three stars that form a triangle. And those are called the Summer Triangle. And those consist of the bright star Deneb, which is in the constellation Cygnus, the bright star Vega in the constellation of Lyra, and the bright star Altair in the constellation Aquila. Now remember I said, guys, you want to go out there around twilight. You want to go ahead and let your eyes get dark adapted. And you let your eyes become dark adapted and it gets a little bit darker. And I look up then those three stars are probably going to be some of the first stars that end up popping out. They are very bright, they are very easy to find, and they form a triangle. And so if I can go ahead and find those three stars, Deneb, Vega, and Altair, then I can use those which anchor the constellation Cygnus, they anchor the constellation Vega, they anchor the constellation Aquila, then from those constellations, I can jump to all the rest of them. I can go from Cygnus to Pegasus. I can go from Pegasus to Aquarius. I can go from Aquarius to Capricorn. And continuing on along then the ecliptic. Or I can go from back to Vega. I can go from Vega then is sitting right next to Hercules. Hercules is right next to Corona Borealis. And Corona Borealis is right next to then Bootes. And so it does indeed get pretty easy to go ahead and find things in the sky because you are either constellation jumping or you are star jumping. Just there's kind of the ecliptic to remind you, those constellations along the ecliptic. And then we have some deep sky objects, just like we did before. I've got two of them on this map, and I'm going to have one of them on the map that had Andromeda on it. Well, if I look up at Hercules, Hercules has a big globular cluster called M13. Now, a globular cluster is very different from an open cluster. It has different types of stars. We find globular clusters are different places in our galaxy as opposed to what the open clusters are. Again, it's going to tell us something about the evolutionary sequence of those stars. And so if you've got a nice size telescope, then you're going to be able to observe M13. Then if I come down to Sagittarius, which is a teapot, 
Like I said, guys, you look in that direction, there's all kinds of deep sky objects because when you're looking at that direction, you're looking toward the center of our galaxy. There's lots more globular clusters. Uh, there's lots more nebulas, all kinds of cool things as I look toward the direction of Sagittarius. Unfortunately, for the most part, since they are, quote, deep sky objects, that means, guys, you have to have a pretty good telescope to be able to see them. And then our third deep sky object that you see during the summer happens to be the Andromeda Galaxy. Andromeda Galaxy is about twice as big as what we are. It's certainly our closest large galaxy. And so eventually, the two of us will run into each other. Ooh, what's going to happen when that big galaxy runs into us? So let's go back and look at pictures. This is M13. And I think you can see by looking at that, it's certainly different from those open clusters that I showed you earlier. M13 is going to have stars that are a whole lot older. Okay, so that means they've already gone through a lot of their evolutionary sequence. And you're going to find that these clusters are much more dense and much, much larger than what you're going to find within an open cluster. Now, this is the Milky Way, and I think this is taken in Hawaii, but I wouldn't swear to it. And obviously, this is a timed exposure to go ahead and bring out the Milky Way. But when you look up and you see that Milky Way, you are simply looking at one of the spiral arms of our galaxy, one of them in the winter, the winter Milky Way, and then another one in the opposite direction during our summer Milky Way. When you go outside and you let your eyes become dark adapted, gradually what you're going to see is just a whole lot more stars themselves, and it's going to kind of look like this white milky material. And then if I look towards Sagittarius, like I said, there's lots of gas and dust out there, and this is just one of the numerous gas and dust nebulas that I have looking towards Sagittarius. And we find, too, that anytime we are looking toward the Milky Way, we're going to find within the Milky Way lots of gas and dust clouds as well. The colors are indicative of not only the temperature of the gas and dust, but also the material that the gas and dust is made out of. And then you have the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, this is about twice the size that we are. Remember that we're about 100,000 light years across. Mm, about 4,000 light years in height, real thin compared to what the length is. Like I said, the Andromeda Galaxy is not quite twice as big as what we are. has billions and billions and billions of stars. You're looking at this more edge on, so you're seeing more of those dark spirals then within the spiral arms themselves. And then Andromeda has two satellite galaxies, one that you see above and one of them you see below. And same thing like what our galaxy does as well. We have a couple of satellite galaxies. We also have a couple of galaxies that appear to be going through or have come out of going through our galaxy. And so when we get into the last unit and we start talking about galaxies and interactions between galaxies, you know, what's going to happen when we go through the Andromeda? Are we going to notice it? Are we going to run into another star? Or are the distances so great between stars within the two galaxies that we'll never know we're doing that unless we happen to be in the core. The core is certainly a little bit denser. But I guarantee you guys that gas and dust is going to go crazy when those two galaxies go through each other. And so when we get into Unit 4, we'll go ahead and I'll show you some galaxies that have formed because two galaxies have gone through each other. They've left their gas and dust behind, and the gas and dust then has gone through and evolved into stars. Okay, guys, so at least that gave you a feel for what your summer constellations were, your winter constellations, and your circumpolar constellations. Now, we did this on a very flat surface. So the next section that I want to talk about, the next section we're going to do, is we're going to go to Google Earth, and we're going to look at the sky map on Google Earth, and I want to take you on a tour of what the sky actually looks like, as well as we're going to use some other websites to give you a feel for what those constellations look like out there in space, as well as there's some deep sky objects, and we just kind of got started with some of our deep sky objects here, and really give you a feel for what's up there in the sky. So with that, guys, I will plan on seeing you then in the next section, in which case we'll take a tour of the universe.